Grammar Girl here, I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between the indefinite articles a and an, and a tidbit about why we talk about being in the limelight. But first, thanks to M. Jemmy, redefining luxury Italian footwear. M. Jemmy's shoes are handcrafted in the same family-owned workshops in Italy where items from the most well-known luxury brands are made, so you can get luxury footwear for a third of the price. Go see for yourself how amazing these shoes are at mjemmy.com slash grammar for $50 off your first pair. That's the letter M, G-E-M-I dot com slash grammar for $50 off your first pair. mjemmy.com slash grammar. M. Jemmy, Italian luxury, made the old way, sold the new way. Also, I have more information about the Sound Education Conference at the Harvard Divinity School. If you're interested in educational podcasting, I'll be on a panel about podcasting on language and linguistics Friday, November 2nd at 4 o'clock with other podcasters from Endless Knot, The History of English, Lexitecture, and The World in Words. And then I know I'm giving a 20-minute live show type talk on Saturday the 3rd. I still don't know what time that will be, but I do know that Dan Carlin of Hardcore History is giving the keynote at 11, so you won't want to miss that. I'll definitely be there. And if you're only interested in the public talks on Saturday, I know they have discounted tickets for people who want to come just for that one day. You can find out more information at soundeducation.fm. And if you decide to come, let me know on social media so I can look for you and say hi. And now on to the show. Have you ever wondered what it means to be in the limelight? Let me tell you right now that it has nothing to do with limes. Instead, it has to do with minerals, lighthouses, and the early days of theater. For starters, to be in the limelight is an expression that means to be under intense public scrutiny, to have all eyes on you. This could be in the moment, for example, if you were an actor on stage in a critical scene, Or it could be over a period of time, if you were a celebrity caught in a scandal, for example. This expression dates back to 1816. A young Scottish engineer named Thomas Drummond had been hired by Britain's Ordnance Survey to create detailed maps of Scotland. But he struggled to get accurate readings in the murky Scottish weather. To solve this problem, he turned to English inventor Sir Goldsworthy Gurney. What a name. Gurney had developed a blowpipe that burned hydrogen and oxygen, which created an extremely hot flame. Gurney found that when he used the flame to heat calcium oxide, also known as quicklime, it produced an intense white light. This light was so spectacular and so much brighter than other lights from that time that viewers were stunned. Here's what one witness said, quote, When the gas began to play, the lime being brought now to its full ignition, a glare shone forth, overpowering. A shout of triumph and admiration burst from all present, unquote. Drummond realized that if he placed a limelight on a reference point in the landscape, it could be seen from miles away, as many as 50 miles away. This would make the work of surveyors measuring distances immensely easier. Drummond's light was used throughout the surveying of Scotland and in the subsequent surveying of Ireland. And starting in 1829, it was put into trial for use in lighthouses. The light it created, said one witness, was, quote, not only more vivid and conspicuous than other types of light, but was peculiarly remarkable from its exquisite whiteness. Indeed, there seems no greater presumption in comparing its splendor to that of the sun, unquote. Unfortunately, the trials didn't pan out. Limelight's brilliant light could only be achieved with, quote, much labor and expensive apparatus, unquote. Basically, even though limelight was super bright, it was too hard to keep in operation for an extended period of time. Nonetheless, by 1837, limelight had been adopted in theaters, and it was in wide use there by 1860. 
stagehands used these brilliant lights to illuminate their stages and create the effect of sunlight or moonlight. They also found a way to direct the light onto one single person, putting them in the limelight. They had to work hard to do it, constantly maintaining tanks of oxygen and hydrogen and carefully feeding lime into a white-hot flame. But they did it, and they continued to do it until the advent of incandescent light rendered limelight obsolete. By the end of the 19th century, limelight had exited theaters, stage left. Over time, the literal sense of being in the limelight took on a metaphoric meaning. It now describes someone receiving the glare of public attention. A recent example might be a certain actress named Meghan Markle, better known now as the Duchess of Sussex. If any public figure has been in the limelight in 2018, it's surely been Ms. Markle, whose every action, hairstyle, and sartorial choice have been dissected by the press. No one has ever said that being in the limelight was easy. So that's your tidbit for today. To be in the limelight means to be at the center of public attention. And it originally did come from the idea of being in a bright light made from a chemical known as quicklime. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to our indefinite articles, thanks to our sponsor this week, Nutrafol, a safe and effective strategy to help you take control of your hair health. Made with 100% drug-free nutraceutical ingredients, clinically shown to improve thinning hair, it's recommended by more than 850 top physicians in some of the top salons in the country. Nutrafol nourishes your hair from within, using an adaptogen called ashwagandha that reduces the body's response to stress. So, no matter what's causing your hair loss, Nutrafol takes action where it's needed. And since it's made with medical-grade botanical ingredients designed to nourish your hair, there are no bad side effects or compromises to overall wellness. There are two distinct formulas, one for men and one for women, to suit your specific metabolic needs. And you can learn more about their available formulas at Nutrafol.com slash grammar. To get your first month's supply with subscription for $10, visit Nutrafol. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com. And use the code grammar during checkout. Again, that's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com. And the code grammar to get your first month's supply for $10 with subscription. And now on to A versus Anne. A lot of people learned the rule that you put A before words that start with consonants and AN before words that start with vowels. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. For example, here's Matthew with a question. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew, and I've been wondering if it's actually AN hour or A hour. AN hour sounds more correct, but A hour reads more correct. I'm just curious on what it should be. The rule is that you use A before words that start with a consonant sound and AN before words that start with a vowel sound. So to answer Matt's question, AN hour is correct because hour starts with a vowel sound. People seem to ask most often about words that start with the letters H and U because sometimes these words start with vowel sounds and sometimes they start with consonant sounds. For example, it's a historic monument because historic starts with an H sound. But it's an honorable fellow because honorable starts with an O sound. Similarly, it's a utopian idea, but an unfair world. The letters O and M can be tricky too. Usually you put an before words that start with O, but sometimes you use A. For example, you'd use A if you were to say she has a one-track mind, because one track starts with a W sound. Similarly, you'd say she has an MBA, but chooses to work as a missionary, because MBA starts with a vowel sound and missionary starts with a consonant sound. Use A before words that start with a consonant sound and an before words that start with a vowel sound. 
Other letters can also be pronounced either way. Just remember it's the sound that governs whether you use a or an, not the actual first letter of the word. One complication is when words are pronounced differently in British English and American English. For example, the word for a certain kind of plant is pronounced herb in American English and herb in British English. So the proper form in America is an herb, and the proper form in Britain is a herb. In the rare cases where this is a problem, use the form that will be expected in your country or by the majority of your readers. While we're talking about different pronunciations, let's talk a bit more about a historic. Some Americans argue that it should be an historic, and one of the most contentious interactions I had at a book signing was over this point. But I come down firmly on the side that says it should be a historic event. Here's my reasoning. Most people pronounce the H in historic, and there's nothing special about the word. So if it starts with a consonant sound, an H sound, it gets an AN in front of it, like all the other words that start with a consonant sound. In some regions, people do drop the H. Linguists call this an unvoiced H. And in grad school, I had a professor from Boston who would say historic instead of historic. He'd also say human instead of human. So if you say historic, or you grew up in a region where everyone says historic, it's reasonable that you might think it should be an historic event, because to you, the word starts with a vowel sound. But that's not the common standard pronunciation in most of the world. So unless you're writing for a regional publication, and all your readers call things historic, it's not the correct choice. If you're feeling argumentative about this point, I'll direct you to the website of the late, great Washington Post copy editor Bill Walsh, which has an exhaustive review of how different style guides deal with this word. But you should know that after reviewing many style guides, he also stood behind a historic being the correct choice. To get into a little more grammar, a and an are called indefinite articles, and the is called a definite article. The difference is that a and and don't say anything special about the words that follow. For example, think about the sentence, I need a gumdrop. You'll take any gumdrop. Just a gumdrop will do. But if you say, I need the gumdrop, then you want a specific gumdrop. There must be something special about that one specific gumdrop you're requesting. That's why the is called the definite article. You want something definite. At least that's how I remember the name. So that's your quick and dirty tip. It's the sound of the next word, not the first letter of the next word, that determines whether you want a or an. Consonant sounds call for an a, and vowel sounds call for an an. And if you go to the a versus an page at quickanddirtytips.com, you'll find an interactive quiz on this topic. Thank you for the nice reviews this week to Fishing Savage and Plug, who listens while commuting through the California coastal redwoods. Beautiful. Also, it's hard to believe it, but it's already time to start pitching my 2019 tip-a-day calendar. It's actually been on sale for a while. If you're looking for a great teacher gift, something for a dear writer friend, or something just for yourself, you can find it at any online bookstore by searching for The Grammar Daily. That's the Grammar Daily. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. Oh,